Hi, this is Thomas with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Featherstone Nutrition. AKA Feathers. And you're listening to Fuel for the Soul podcast, the podcast where we chat all things nutrition and hydration for performance. And some other nonsense sometimes. Definitely other nonsense all the yeah. time. So let's get into it. So before we dive into our listener question, let's talk about our sponsor, Inside Tracker. Thomas, what is Inside Tracker? Funny you should ask. Inside Tracker is an ultra personalized nutrition platform that uses blood work to create one of a kind, science backed action plan to help you reach your potential for better performance and a longer, healthier life. Yeah, so they were founded in 2009, and the Boston company first started working with professional athletes who wanted to see what their biomarkers, hormone, and mineral profiles look like during their training and how they could use nutrition and lifestyle to improve. Get this, they measure over 30, 30 biomarkers and recommend food and supplements to optimize things like your energy, cognition, endurance, heart health, and more. And... The really great news for you all is for a limited time, Inside Tracker is offering our listeners 25% off their entire store. Boom. Just go to insidetracker.com slash fuel. All Today, we have a question from Allie about race day nutrition. So let's take a listen. Hi, my name is Allie, and I'm planning for the Wine Glass Marathon. I need to make sure my race day nutrition is right. Is five Martin, so one every five miles, a good amount, or is that overdoing it? I hope to go sub four hours. Thanks. All right, so five well, Martins, one every five miles. First of all... Do you know what this reminds me of, though? What? Like, I just saw a post that Allie Kiefer did. Where she laid out her Martins and she was doing regular caffeine, regular caffeine, regular caffeine. And I was like, that's a ton of caffeine. How's your head not pop off? <laughs> okay, so first of all, let's <laughs> chat. That's it. Race day, <laughs> race day nutrition on timing versus mile markers and how much and yeah all that yeah is it better to do time or mileage so i see people doing it both ways but i honestly tell people to go by time more so than by mileage um but if somebody likes that mileage piece right they're watching their watch and watching a certain mileage tick by we can do that i just often see people aren't taking it frequently enough when they're going by mileage um because the biggest thing with race day fueling is we want to start early. The one mistake I see with a lot of people is waiting to fuel or waiting till we feel like we need to fuel to actually take that gel. And if we feel like we need it, it's too late because it takes at least, you know, 10 to 15 minutes to get a gel from our stomach into our bloodstream to help with our performance. If it's something like a more whole foods gel, it's going to take even longer than that. So, you know, let's say something like the Martin, it's going to take like 10 minutes to get into our system. So if we're waiting till we feel like we need it, you know, we're going to crash in the meantime. So I tell people to start early, start up front. You know, a lot of people will take one in the start line and then every 30 minutes as, as we're doing the race. And, you know, typical sports nutrition is pretty prescriptive in a timeline like that. Like we say anywhere from, you know, 30 to 60 grams of carbs per hour is what people want. Um, so, you know, in order to get that in, we have to start early and we need to start early in the race. So, you know, Allie brings up a good point. So she wants to take it every five miles. It kind of depends on your pace, right? So for some people that could be 50 minutes into the race, that's waiting too long or somebody that's a lot faster, you know, maybe that is around, you know, 30 minutes. So we just want to make sure that we're taking that into account too. So are you saying, I think Martin recommend every 45 minutes, you're saying every 30 minutes. Yeah. So when we really look at performance, you know, we, if, if somebody's looking to PR a race, I always try to get them to take 50 grams of carbs an hour, which most gels are about 25 grams of carbs. So that's two gels an hour. Right. I mean, if you look at some of the pros that are even faster, they're taking a gel every 5k. So they're fueling, you know, 80 to 90 grams well, of carbs an hour. That's what I was surprised when I saw, uh, Ali Kiefer's post was how many, uh, Martins she was taking because She's going to be finishing a lot faster than most would. And 
that seemed like a lot of Martins, but you're saying no, like, Hey, as many as you can get in. Yeah. And the, well, I mean, to a point, right. I actually have seen a couple of clients coming to me that were actually taking too many gels for the pace that they were doing out there. So that is possible, right? We can't over gel, but I very rarely see that. But, you know, I think the pros are really leading the scene here and showing us that you need to fuel. Like if you watch some of them in the race, they're literally fueling either with oftentimes the Martin in the bottle, right? So you can't tell they're fueling. I had some questions on that after the Olympics. How are they doing this only on water? I'm like, no, no, guys, there was, <laughs> you know, carbs and, 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 and Martin in the bottle as well. Or you'll see them with like the gel taped to their bottle and they're fueling literally, you know, every 15, 20 minutes throughout that race. So, you know, when you were laying out Allie's uh, gel, I counted in my head. So you said six gels when you were alternating those things. Um, you know, it, so it might have been more than need. that. But... It looked like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And yeah. It, what about the amount of caffeine? Does it matter how much caffeine you use? Like, can't like to me, that seemed like my tolerance for caffeine would be pushed to the limits if I was doing every other one. A because I, how many milligrams are in the Martin? It's pretty high. Hundred. Hundred milligrams, milligrams, milligrams of caffeine per gel. How much is in a cup of coffee? So it's about 80 grams or I'm sorry, 80 milligrams of of caffeine in like a home brewed cup of coffee. So, um, so that would be like drinking three cups of coffee out there uh, more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. So I always, I've, I've seen it go both ways. So I've had some athletes that have had really bad reactions to taking a hundred milligrams of caffeine during a run. So we've cut that out. I've had other people tell me it might've been you Meg that it's rocket fuel if you take it at the right time. Right. So, um, I think it's something we absolutely have to practice. And to your point, Thomas, she's alternating right? No one is going to be able to tolerate every single gel out there as a caffeinated gel when it has a hundred milligrams per gel. Like you're going to be an anxious mess. Your GI tract's going to hate you. Your heart's going to be beating out of your chest. So we do need to be careful with how much we actually take and then practice, you know, how to execute that. You yeah, personally, I, I don't know about you, Meg, but I usually use it as an exclamation point. So when I take that caffeine one, it's usually plain, plain, caffeine plane like it's it's mm -hmm. when i'm deep into my run that i want that extra little kick of hey wake up i think i actually saved it for my last gel at um the woodlands marathon in march where you ran and sub three. it i actually mentioned because thomas made my morning coffee <laughs> decaf and Accident. i I felt off pretty much the whole race. I'm not going to say it was because of that, but in my I, defense, I am. Uh, can I def can I say what happened for those who don't know? The hotel had packets of Starbucks sealed coffee that you just took one out and you threw it into the top of the coffee maker and it dripped coffee. We got up at like four or something in the morning. It was early. I'm not paying. Like my eyes are half awake. I just open the thing and I throw it in and brew up the coffee <laughs> a decaf one um, and Meg happens to at see at what point did you realize it was decaf not until I got back I thought you were from, walking out the door or no when yeah when I was leaving I was just tidying up because I was all anxious to go and he had already left for his warm-up so I was just tidying up our room and I went to throw away the wrapper and it said decaf on it oh mental mental bomb <laughs> and at that point you know you can't drink more coffee because I'm going to go head out to the start line and I don't want to have to pee 7,000 times. Yeah. So anyway, right. I saved the caffeine one for my last gel at that marathon. And I do feel like it gave me this extra jolt of energy at the end to finish. But my, I guess my question yeah. would be to feathers would like, am I not taking enough of the caffeine ones? Should I try to take more? So, Personally, the way I play around with it with athletes, I think two is plenty for most of us mere mortals in, in a race. You know, maybe even one is okay. So I have a lot of folks that I'm playing with using one of these towards the end of the marathon when there's like an hour, hour and a half left. So, of course, if I'm telling you guys to try it, you know, this past weekend was my 20 miler with some marathon pace in it. So I used I used scratch chews. So I used my chews for the first two hours. And then I took the quote unquote rocket fuel, the Martin with a hundred milligrams of caffeine. And at first I was like, whoa, like I felt like it went right <laughs> to my head. And I was like, that was not good. Right. But then once I kept running, I'm like, no, this is good. This definitely increases performance. So, um, 
you know, I'm on, I'm on bandwagon there. Cause it does. So, you know, sugar obviously helps fuel our body, but caffeine actually increases our mental alertness, decreases our perceived exertion. So when we're thinking about it from that point, like when do we become mentally fatigued in a marathon at the end? Right. So if we're saving and taking that like bolus of caffeine at the end to get our mind back in the game, to decrease that exertion level a little bit back down to where we want it to be, you know, like at the half, um, you know, it can be really helpful. So, you know, I would recommend, you know, thinking back like 90 minutes from when you're finished time and maybe try to have some caffeine with your gel done. All right. So back to Allie's question. She wants to run a sub four hour marathon. So she's going to be out there for I mean, at that point, you just you fuel for four hours. So, you know, if she can get done faster and have an extra gel in her, in her back pocket, great. Wait, so is that six? I'm trying to do math right now. Every, Every 30 minutes. Yeah, so five. Five. Five might not be enough for her if she's trying to finish in four hours, right? Because if we're taking if one we're at the start every 30. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, especially if she's taking one at the start, 30, 60, 90, two hours, two and a half, three, three and a half. That's actually eight. Um, if she's taking one before she starts, which Ooh, is Megan would have had her too short. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, I think if we could get her to do one at the start and six during, so both Allie and anyone trying to run a four hour marathon, I think if you, if you carry six gels on you for the race, I think you should be good. And I always tell people another reason we want to fuel early is because I think we can all probably think of a race where maybe we had a, the 10 K left and our stomach just turned, right? Like the thought of taking fuel over those last six miles was maybe out of the question. If we wanted to keep running in a straight line and not to a bathroom, um, or just feeling nauseous. I mean, that's very, very common when we are pushing our body to PR pace for a long time. At some point, our stomach might be like, Nope. And that's because all our blood is going to our muscles. We don't have very good perfusion to our GI tract. And depending on how sensitive our GI tract is, some people might have issues at the end of the race. So rather than feeling like we have to force that and then you know, cross our fingers and really hope that nothing bad happens from a GI standpoint, we can be like, hey, I fueled really well. Starting at 30 minutes, I'm going to be fine to rock out this last 10K without anything else. So, you know, it's really an insurance policy if we start early too. So I have a question about that kind of related. This past weekend, I was also doing a long run and had a big chunk of marathon pace in it. And I packed my gels and I planned when I was going to take them, which was 5, 10, and 15. And I forgot to take mine at 10. And I looked down at my watch and it was 13 miles in and I was like, shit. And so I <laughs> took it at 13. And at this point, I'm starting to feel a little fatigued because I have like seven miles at marathon pace on my legs. And then like 17 rolled around and I was like, should I take another one, even though I just took one? like not that long ago, or I think it was even earlier than that, like 15 or 16. So I tried to take another one and then I spent the next few miles feeling like I might vomit. <laughs> and so my question is, if we mess up fueling out there, is it best to try and still take it in or should we just let it go? I would say if we mess up fueling, we need to refigure fueling from there on out. Okay. So rather than try to force it close together, like you said, like you saw. So if we put too much sugar into our stomach, especially if we put too much sugar without any fluid. So even though a lot of the gels claim you don't need to take water with this, you know, we're still going to do better if we have some fluid in there to dilute that sugar. So if we're thinking if we're like doubling up on how much is in there, um, we might have issues, right? So I would maybe take it a little closer than, you know, your 30 minutes. But yeah, I wouldn't like try to get back on track with your plan i think that might be a little risky kind of exactly like you experienced yeah um you just get a little nauseous there's a lot going on in that stomach and not a whole lot of blood going there to help it out um i i'll tell you i don't know what it is towards it's what i'm trying to say is there's some days where you know it's really easy to take your martin and there's other days where it's a struggle like i don't know what it is like the chemical taste the overly sweet um Gel and and as a sweet one, the Martin's not even like I would say the the sweetest, but it, it, is that I would think that I would get a positive feeling because I know that the energy is going to come, and so your brain would positively reinforce you having that uh, calorie intake. Why am I sometimes struggling, especially towards the end of a run, to to get it in? Because I don't think it's a GI tract thing. I think it's just like I don't want 
I think part of it could be a hydration thing. So when we get dehydrated, you know, your mouth gets dry. It, just the thought of taking another gel is just like, ugh. And also flavor fatigue. So you say, you know, Martin doesn't have a flavor to it, but it's just kind of bland, yeah. right? So you can kind of get sick of that. So I have a lot of athletes that alternate. They'll do like the Huma gels and a Martin and a Huma gel and a Martin. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do scratch chews and Martin, like kind of back and forth so that I don't get that fatigue. But some people don't mind. I mean, some people will rock out the exact same flavor of the exact same gel for, you know, 20 weeks of training and then on race day. So it's just finding what you're preferences because the one thing I see time and time again with my athletes is they aren't fueling right they're not fueling enough for race day and a lot of times it comes down to what are you going to be willing to take out there yeah. on a run right and we got to find what that is so that they actually and the it. other question I guess I would have is most of the racing clothes are limited pocket space so you're talking about for Allie here you're talking about what we said six six, six Martins that's not a tiny bit. That's like a bandolier of, of Martins at, at some point. What do, you, what do you recommend to people to use to hold their nutrition during the race? Yeah, it is a total pain. I, I agree. I think a lot of people wear a belt. I personally cannot stand anything Same. around my waist. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of people are that way. So, at least for females, they make a lot of sports bras that are actually like double, and then you can pull one layer out so that you can like shove fuel literally in the front of your sports bra. And honestly, I think that's one of the best places because it doesn't really mess with your stride, right? Your arms are up, you're running, you're running, you pull out your sports bra, you grab some chews, you grab a gel, and you're ready to go. So, I think for a lot of people, that can be helpful, or sometimes in the back of the sports bra. Um, or then there are a lot of shorts that the waistband is almost a pocket all the way around, both guys and girls, right? So that you kind of have a couple different spots that you're putting them into. Um, personally, if I'm running a cold race, I shove it into my gloves. So I wear like a really tight, like $2 pair of gloves from Target, and I'll put it like in the palm of my hand. And you don't even notice that it's there and then it's warm when you take it instead of it being frozen if it's really cold out. It's like Spider-Man, um, but with goo. So I think, or, <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. No, I mean, I know it sounds weird, but I think it works really well. So it's just kind of finding like where you don't mind and where it doesn't chafe too, right? So before the double sports brown. I do, yeah. I, I like a belt. And I found um, some people, uh, one of my friends, he likes the spy belt. But I find that bounces a lot because you can get, especially if you had six Martins in it, it's going to be bouncing. Um, so I kind of like the flip belt because it's flat and you can tuck, tuck a fair amount of um, gels in there. And typically I try to have, you know, I know that the caffeine's on one side. So it's like as I work through them, mm -hmm. I know sooner or later I'm going to hit that mm -hmm. caffeine one. It's a good idea. And I think it's easier for guys to wear some of those belts because they're straight, right? Like female that has hips, it's just really easy for it to like scoot straight yeah. up on their waist. Um, so I think it's just, you gotta practice again, you know, what, what works. I can't stop thinking about the fact that your marathon was cold enough that you got to wear gloves. I know, it was amazing. It was 28 degrees at the start line. This was the Indianapolis? Mm-hmm, in 2019, it was beautiful. It was like exactly my perfect, I still sweat. I mean, don't get me wrong, but uh, it was, it I'm, was wonderful. I've got my fingers crossed for a fluke 30 degree day. Oh, I mean, I'll take like high 40s and I'll True. be ecstatic. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, we'll see. But anyway, back to fueling. Let's say someone is totally against the sports nutrition products. Can you fuel with real food out there? You can, you absolutely can. And I think a lot of people that I see that do that are, you know, coming from the ultra world, right? Where that's pretty common. They're out there for so long, like we need meals, we need snacks, we need soup, we They're need sandwiches, we need M&Ms, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Of, of food and snacks. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, sports nutrition products are engineered to give you what you need in the right quantity to be absorbed very quickly and very efficiently and not cause GI upset. Right. So to me, it's like, why wouldn't you use sports products? That's exactly what they're designed for. Um, but I do have a lot of people who don't. So a lot of people like those applesauce squeeze pouches. So my biggest issue with those is it's a huge volume to get in enough carbohydrates. So, I mean, we were just talking about how hard it is to stuff six yeah. gels yeah. into some somewhere. Plus, you <laughs> look like you're running. getting dropped off at preschool. Maybe, yeah, I guess you would need a pack, yeah. right? With all those like pouches and things in it to get enough Fruit roll fuel. Ups. <laughs> um, right? 
Well, some people will use like um, Swedish fish or candy or gummy bears. Or, I, I've seen you know, a Swedish fish, but yeah, the, the thing is that those are great for, you know, trying to keep it real, I guess. But the Swedish fish don't have the sodium added to them. They don't have like when you're looking at a scratch chew, for example, versus a Swedish fish, that thing is powder caked in, in electrolytes and salt, cr- salt. Yeah. And then you're also mm-hmm. getting the sugars mm-hmm. and the carbs. So, you know, you really are packing in the nutrients that you need in a smaller package. The, and I think people think they're saving money sometimes when they do like when the chia thing came out and when Tar Hamar running and all that stuff with the born to run book, like all of a sudden everybody's eating chia and flax seeds and stuff like that. And it was supposed to be this super fuel. And I, 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 I've tried everything. And for me, the concocted super fuels work like they're supposed to. Well, and you bring up, yeah, you bring up a good point, Thomas, because we have different get to be a total nerd. We have different ways that we absorb carbohydrates in our body. So we have multiple different carbohydrate transporters, right? So in order to really maximize how much fuel our body can absorb and use at one time, we want different types of carbohydrates. So that's why you'll sometimes you'll see sucrose and fructose and maltodextrin. All of those types of things are absorbed a little bit differently. So these sports products are engineered to have the right balance of those types of things so that we absorb them the fastest with the littlest GI upset. For example, like fructose, if we have too much of it, causes a lot of GI upset in a lot of people. So if we're doing something like dried fruit that has a ton of fructose in it, we might actually cause ourselves some issues. So again, just more backup that these engineered fuels are actually giving us, to Thomas's point, the electrolytes, the types of sugar, the balance of sugar that our body actually needs. So, I mean, that's always my first recommendation for runners. We've been talking about Martin, which is our preferred choice for out on the race course. But one thing I didn't realize was that the Martin has basically no or very minimal sodium. And I am a very salty sweater. So the last race I was continually taking in scratch. Are you choosing to take the scratch chews for that reason? Or do you just prefer them? I just prefer chews, truthfully, because to, you know, scratch chews have some sodium, but they still don't have a ton. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we do have to rely on our drink to get those electrolytes or they do make some gels like Huma makes a plus version that has a ton of sodium in it. Right. So like if we need that, we can find them out. There. I like those tablets, the chewable tablets from um, the salt, salt stick. Yeah. yeah. Salt stick makes it chewable. They have a watermelon mm-hmm. flavor and they have like a lime flavor. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like a chalky salty like chew Uh, like for me yeah carrying extra stuff on race day is a super pain like to try to pull a tablet out of a little plastic bag while you're trying to do your max pace is kind of you know tough but you know i think if you think about it this way it's like penny wise pound foolish if you slow down for a second to get that salt in and you don't cramp up and don't um dehydrate it's worth that extra mm-hmm. maybe three or four slow down seconds that it's going to take you to, you know, get, get it out of a plastic bag. Right. And the same thing with um, fuel. So I have a lot of people that like don't take fuel well when they're running and I'm like, then step off to the side, suck that gel down and get right back at it. Right. Like that's how important fuel is. Like, yes, we can practice and learn to do it while we're running, but if you haven't mastered that yet, there's nothing wrong with that. Or if we need to walk through a uh, water station you know, before I carried my own handheld in races, I used to have to like take like three steps of walking through each to make sure I got the actual fluid in my mouth and not all over my face, right? So I think those are the things that are gonna save us if we don't get too dehydrated, if we stay on top of nutrition and we just need to be flexible with what we need to do to get our bodies the nutrition it needs because we're all a little bit different. Like don't worry about looking dumb, right? I mean, I literally carried a handheld for 20 miles of my sub three marathon, you know, like that's not normal. That's probably not how most people did it, but that's how I needed to do it. So I did, you know, so, you know, don't be afraid of what you're supposed to look like out there. Like make sure you have I, I the fuel and hydration. I don't think it's a, a fear of always how you look. I think sometimes it's a matter of, I'm trying to go fast here. Uh, having a water bottle in my hand, Mm, is that going to slow me down? Like, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. obviously it worked out for you. But 
in all these things, I guess you have to test. And even when we're going back to Allie saying, she needs to test on her long runs and on her workouts, how many of these gels she can ingest and still feel like it's a positive thing. Um, Meg, are you gonna run with a water bottle? I think so. I just, it makes me nervous. I'm such a salty sweater. I would prefer, I think, to have the confidence of the scratch in my hand and just have a little extra weight than to feel like unknown of what could happen out there. They're only like 24 bucks. It's worth just checking, 100%. right? Like for that security. And I mean, think how much money we throw into running, like <laughs> worth it, worth it, worth it. So, I mean, I think you bring up a good point, Meg, is it's not just about the the carbs we're taking in. It's about hydration too. So we've all trained through a really hot summer. Hopefully we're all going to get cooler races this fall. Um, but we still need to hydrate. So, you know, I know we have a great podcast here on hydration. So hopefully you guys have all been nailing it over the summer, but we need to think through that piece for race day two. Are we going to use what's on the course? How often do we need to stop? Are we going to carry something and just make sure that we're accounting for that too? Um, speaking of that, let's say we have our race plan, like for Allie. Okay. She's going to take six gels out on the course. Um, she's expecting a 50 degree day. It's crazy. It's 80 degrees, 90% humidity at the start. Does she Drop. have to, does she have to change? Drop. <laughs> does she have to change her plan? Or does she need to factor that in or is it just stay the course? So the gels would stay the same, but the fluid is going to be totally yeah. different. Run right? with so a water cooler. For somebody like you, <laughs> right, and stop at every single table. And probably, honestly, you know, they put like one to two ounces yeah. of fluid in those cups. You probably need two cups if it's going to be a hot day. Or somebody like you or I who are really salty, like we probably need to put some salt pills in our little handheld, right, so that when we run out of our own fluid, we can take those with whatever's on course. So there's – that's why I always watch the the weather with my athletes, because if something fluky like that happens, we're probably not going to be able to run as fast as we want to, but we can do a lot to support ourselves to be able to run the best we can that day. So we just adjust. Okay. We talked pretty thoroughly through out there on the course race day, but let's take a quick little step back. And we kind of talked about this on the last episode of the podcast with taper and carb loading, but race morning before we actually get to the start line, what should we be ingesting? Like how many carbs do we, do we need to take in? How much should we hydrate? And when should we stop? Because as I noted earlier, you don't wanna have to pee while you're at the starting corral. That's a good point. So I like people to eat about two hours before their race. Um, most of us need about 75 grams of carbohydrates. So I don't expect that number to resonate with many people, right? So what that would be is like a bagel or half a cup of oats and a banana two hours beforehand. And then if we take a gel in the start line, 50, 25, we got our 75 grams of carbs. So I, I often like to people to kind of separate it a little bit because if we have carb loaded well, we are not going to be hungry race day morning. We're not going to feel like, oh, I need breakfast because we've been, you know, fully stocked. We're tapered. We're not exercising as much those couple days. Um, but we need to eat something, right? So, um, you know, grabbing that, you know, simple carbohydrate, whatever we've practiced two hours beforehand. And there's often some race nerves. So sometimes it's hard to get that down. I was working with somebody that gets very nervous before their race. She'll be in wine glass as well. And, um, pop tarts are sitting much better for her. So she's watching like an episode of the office while she eats a pop tart. So she's not quite so nervous to get that nutrition in because I've talked to a lot of people who I'm so nervous. I can't eat before the race. So we've got to find a way, like, is it a different food? Is a bagel feel too heavy? Do you need five, six graham crackers? You know, what's that going to look like? And we practice it and then top off that fuel tank, right. With some chews or a gel in the start line. Um, people who are starting a later race, we want to do that same thing, but we're probably going to need like another food in between. So like if the race isn't until 10 or something like that, we need like a bagel two hours later, another bagel. And then, right. So we just kind of need to take it in two hour increments leading up to the okay, race. Okay. And what about coffee? Is there, is that the same timeline? Yeah. So that's the other thing. If we're fully hydrated and carb loaded, like we don't need a ton of fluid race day okay. morning, truthfully. Um, you know, if we wake up and we're like, oh crap, I really screwed that up. I, I'm dehydrated. Then definitely drink, right? But if we've done it right, really the fluid we take in in the morning is to wet our whistle and to get us some caffeine. So whether that's eight ounces of coffee, whether that's 12 ounces of coffee, and then 
an hour before the race, I tell people just sip if you need a little bit of fluids, but like shut down like massive fluid intake an hour before the race. So hopefully then, you know, you don't have to pee on course. Cool. Okay. So then what about afterwards? We cross the finish line. Hopefully we nailed it. We got a PR. Do we need to be thinking about recovery foods or is it just go do whatever you want? We party. <laughs> no, <laughs> honestly, if this is your goal race, this is what you built up for. You probably don't need to rush recovery after a goal race. So a lot of times this is where I'm like, just enjoy yourself. If you're hungry, grab a banana. If you're thirsty, grab a bottle of Gatorade, you know, whatever they have at the finish, but literally enjoy yourself. Like I, I harp into people that, you know, 30 to 90 minute recovery window after a hard effort. So of course that still applies to race day, but at the same time, if you're stressed about your recovery nutrition and not enjoying that moment and not being present there, like, I don't want that to happen. So I always tell people like, just enjoy it, have fun. And then on the flip side is, we probably don't have another race for quite a while and we will recover. It just, when we don't eat within that recovery window, it delays recovery and maybe that's okay. If we're not planning on doing a darn thing for the next week, we have time to recover. You know, we don't need to rush it. If you're one of those crazy people who signed up for three fall <laughs> races, okay, maybe we need to like really nail recovery immediately after that race. If we have another race in four weeks or something like that. Um, but, you know, I really think this is the time to just relax and enjoy and and not be so uptight about nutrition. Yeah, I find especially if I fuel properly out on the marathon that I am not hungry for a while afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I always want something really salty, like French fries. You're going to enjoy the post wine glass marathon uh, celebrations that we do. We had like last year. We basically just just walked down the main street and just went into every bar we could and got a drink. So it's good. My training partner and I after Indy, because I she had broken through a million times and I called her um, my meal ticket. I was like, she's going to get me to that finish line in sub three. And she and I both our husbands were there. And same thing. We just had so much fun afterwards. I mean, she was walking on her hands <laughs> down the middle of the street and we were just having a blast. So um, I think that's you work so hard and you dedicate so much to these races, whether you rock that PR or are a little disappointed in your finish, whatever it is like it's that's the time. To I agree. I love it. And if you're listening, you should probably download the carb manual what do you call it meg what's the egg it's it's the it's like an ebook but, for no, carb loading. but what's it is it just called carb loading carb yeah. loading carb ebook. load ebook um mm -hmm. it's 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 free mm -hmm. right it's free and i made it stupid stupid simple right like carb loading does not have to be hard it's actually probably the easiest part of nutrition with your training but i it's the one thing i see people mm -hmm. mess up the most right so like stupid simple carb loading ebook free. and i'll probably be like to my Megan, not to feathers. Where's that book that has the carb thing? The night before. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. Three, three days, days out. out. All right. Get it three days out. Um, anything else we want to remind people of? I think if you're listening to this and you're heading into your goal, a race, just to relax. And you've spent all this time training and working really hard. You've and done everything you can do. Now just have fun. Yeah. And... We've simplified the nutrition, or rather Megan has simplified the nutrition for you, and you can easily nail that. So make sure you lock that down and yeah, enjoy race day. You know what people should do though? If, if they have a question, they should go to the Anchor app and submit their question so we can hear their voice on our show. If you're too shy and you don't want people to hear your voice, you can always email. Meg, where do they email? Uh, fuel for the soul podcast at gmail.com and we can just read your question aloud and answer it here on the show or as thomas mentioned you can send us an audio file all right guys thanks so much for listening and we will be back in a couple weeks bye feathers see you guys <laughs>